I want to continue today and talk to us about God's holy days. These festivals that God has given to us as believers. Now we've talked about the fact that they're not important for our salvation, but they are really important when we begin to understand the symbolisms behind them. Let me give you two words that are going to help you to understand why these holidays, these holy days are so important for us. The first is that God said that these were holy convocations. They, they were special meetings. And the word in Hebrew is the word mikra. And it's probably a word that you haven't heard before. But it doesn't matter. The fact is that that word mikra is very, very important. Because in the Hebrew, it means that they are rehearsals. Not just a regular rehearsal, but a special kind of rehearsal. Think about being in church and you're getting ready uh, maybe for the Christmas play. Perhaps you're getting ready for your, your Easter cantatas that are coming up in your churches. And what happens is months in advance we start to rehearse. We start to get ready. And nobody's really serious. Everybody's kind of messing around because it seems like it's so far off. But the closer we get to the actual event, the closer we get to the actual day where the play is going gonna, is gonna to air or we're going to perform it, everybody gets really serious. Why? The dress rehearsal, the night before the main event, we get really serious, and we do it that night as if it's the real deal. God said that's what the feasts are. They're rehearsals. Every time you get ready, every time you celebrate them, you're rehearsing, you're getting ready. For what? The second word is God said these are my feasts, my appointed times, which means moed. And moed just means that, an appointed time, a time set apart. And so when you think about what these festivals mean is God saying that these holy days, when you celebrate them, you're rehearsing, you're preparing, you're getting ready for what? For an appointed time, for something that's yet to be, for something that's going to come. Let me illustrate it in this way. When God spoke to Moses, he told them that he had to take a lamb, he had to sacrifice that lamb, he had to take the blood, he had to apply the blood. But what did that mean? God was saying, Moses, I want you to rehearse with this lamb. This sweet, perfect, little, spotless lamb, I want you to rehearse with it. For thousands of years, every year at Passover, they rehearsed with this lamb. They were getting ready for one day when John the Baptist would declare in the wilderness, Behold, what? The Lamb of God. And so what we're going to do is I want to talk about how Jesus fulfills all of these feasts. They clearly point to him in every way. And I also want to look at how do they speak to us as the church today. It's important to understand that they had symbolic meaning, but they also still speak to us day, today as the church. Let me draw your attention to Exodus chapter 12, verse 7. And God again is speaking that they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides, the top, and the other sides of the door frames of the houses uh, where, uh, where they eat the lambs. Now, why is that important? You know, uh, people always say, Joe, why do you take so much time to, to talk about all the details of the text? Because God is a detailed God, and he puts things there for a reason. They're not there just by accident. Now, I want you to have this in your mind. God said, Moses, take the, the blood of the lamb, apply it to the side, the top, and the side. God didn't say, take the container that's filled with lamb's blood and, and douse the door completely. He didn't ask him to do any other kind of pattern, but he was very specific, right? And he said, side, top, and side. Why is that important? Because as we do that, when we go up like this to the side and then back down, we're actually creating a Hebrew letter. Now, I don't know if you are aware of that, but that's the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That's called the letter Chet. And Chet actually means life. It's the symbol for life. And I want you to think about this. When the angel of death came to the home of every Hebrew in Egypt, when the angel of death came, he saw the letter of life. He saw the symbol of life written on the door of the home. And when he saw life, he had to pass over the home. Now, this is one of those things that we see. Remember, we talked about earlier how Paul said that these feasts are symbolic. Well, here's a symbol, the letter of life. And there's a question that I would, it would be wrong for me not to ask, is have we taken the blood? Have we applied it to the doorposts of our hearts? so that when the angel of death comes to us, does he pass over us? Recently, I had a chance to be in China, and when I was there, um, we did two back-to-back -back sessions that were 10 hours in length, and these precious uh, Chinese pastors came from all over Southeast China to this little home in an underground church, and uh, I was teaching them just like I am now, and I'd prepared for two hours of material, and they asked me to do 10 hours, and we did. And it was such, such an awesome time to see these precious people just soaking and taking in these Hebraic roots. And while I was teaching, 
They were quiet for the most part. They, they were just, they, they were taking it in, they were absorbing it. But then we got to the one part of the service and everybody started to get, you know, re really alive and they were getting very animated. And uh, of course, I didn't know what they were saying because I was speaking through a translator. And as I'm teaching this to you even now, I can see it again in my mind, being there in this little room. And the church here in the West, we are so, we need to be thankful for everything we have. We have beautiful pews, we have nice churches, good PA systems. And I was sitting in this little apartment with a sound system that kept squawking every few seconds. And they were sitting in these little kindergarten style chairs. And they sat there for 10 hours with a piece of paper and a pen. And they were jotting everything down. And then as I was talking through my translator, they started to get really excited. And I didn't know what all the, all the noise was about. But then almost in unison, they began to, to yell in an excitement back to the translator. And they said, tell Pastor Joe that what he's talking about, we do this right here in China. And I said, what are you talking about? Do you celebrate Passover? What, what do you mean? And they showed me a picture of a house. And what they do every year in Chinese homes, not just in China, but all around the world, you know what they do? They take strips of red and they put it over the side, the top, and the sides of their homes in China. And then I began to understand why they were so excited. They said, Pastor Joe, we don't do this as Christians because we always heard it was superstitious. They were taught that when they put that symbol on their doors, that was, um, it was a symbol that would keep out evil spirits from coming into their homes. And they said, now we know it wasn't evil spirits. This represents the blood of Jesus. And they were so excited. And even now as I teach you, I hope that you're getting excited because you can take that symbol we don't have to take blood. We don't have to sacrifice lambs anymore. But symbolically, we can take the life that's in the blood of Jesus. And we can apply it to the doorposts of our home, to the side, the top, and the sides. Now today, the most important symbol in, in, in the Passover is a piece of matzah, a flat piece of bread. We'll talk about that a little bit later uh, this week. But in the times of the temple, the most important thing was, was the actual lamb. And all the lambs that were used in Passover came from the village of Bethlehem. They didn't come from Jerusalem or Nazareth, but they all came from Bethlehem. And that's important because Bethlehem in Hebrew is made of two words, Bet Lechem, which means the house of bread. And Jesus, who said he was the bread of life, he came and he was even born in the house of bread. And all the lambs in Bethlehem were put in, in special fields. And they were actually called certain fields. You couldn't mix Passover lambs with non-Passover lambs. They had to be perfect in every way. And remember on the night that Jesus was born, the angels appeared to what? To shepherds over a certain field. And Luke, who's the doctor, in chapter 2 of his gospel, this is what he says in verse 12, and this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe what? Wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Now remember I said earlier, why is it important uh, to pay attention to the details of scripture? Luke doesn't just say he was wrapped in any kind of a cloth, but he says a swaddling cloth. That is super important because in the days of the Bible, a swaddling cloth was only used to wrap dead bodies in. And here we see that Joseph, as a Jewish man, would be carrying a swaddling cloth because he was on a long journey. If he had died along the way, he would have had to wrap his body. So here he sees this newborn baby. What does he do without even thinking? He grabs his swaddling cloths. He begins to wrap the newborn baby. And we see that even at his birth, Jesus was marked for death both by his earthly father and by his heavenly father. So let me tell this to you straight. The message is this, that Jesus wasn't killed by anybody. He gave up his life. You see, here, here's the difference. Jesus wasn't killed for you, but he died for you. Do, do you hear the difference, friends? And as we understand that even on the night of his birth, he was marked for death by his father. And I want you to understand that as we go back to that night that we celebrate Christmas at, we see God's hand at work. And what happens is, this is all because of the feast. We look back at Passover. We see that the lambs had to be wrapped. But Jesus wasn't wrapped in just any cloth, but he was wrapped in a cloth where he was marked for death. And I hope that the one thing you can take away from you, this segment, is that Jesus wasn't killed for you, but he died for you.